Uh, I'm so very excited to welcome back to Politics and Prose, Lindsay Lynch, uh, with her debut novel, Do Tell. Uh, all us booksellers, and you all as well, uh, know this work has been years in the making, including, I'm sure, some hours spent writing in our break room downstairs. <laughs> Uh, Lindsay worked for Politics and Prose as a bookseller, book a month and uh, subscriptions coordinator and with our classes and programs department. And she is now a book buyer at Parnassus Books in Nashville. Uh, Do Tell, set in the old Hollywood leading up to the war, features Edie O'Dare, a failed actress turned gossip columnist with her, with her insider position, attempting to find the right balance between exposing the truth, protecting her friends, making a living, and setting right a glaring injustice. Long before the Me Too movement, this is a wonderful historical novel filled with unexpected turns and a lot of depth. Ann Patchett calls it a wonderfully provocative novel, and Emma Straub says, glorious, tawdry, and human. Uh, joining Lindsay in conversation is another PMP alum, Lily Meyer, formerly our events coordinator and now working as a translator and writer. Her first novel, Short War, will be released next year. So please join me in welcoming Lindsay Lynch and Lily Meyer back to Politics and Prose. This is fun. <laughs> Give me five minutes to get in the chair. Well, hi, y'all. <laughs> hi, I'm Lindsay Lynch. Welcome to Politics and Prose. You want to read or you want me to ask you personal questions? I think we'll read and then we'll get into the personal questions. And I'm going to steal this copy off the table. Um, my parents are getting a redo of the beginning of the book, which they heard last night at Parnassus. Um, so I'm just going to start with the first chapter and read a little bit. Um, we're here with Edie O'Dare. It's 1939. And let's get into it. Let's gossip a little bit. One. The last time I saw Charles Landry in Los Angeles, he told me I had gotten everything wrong. Everything I asked him? Everything. It wasn't the first time someone had leveled this accusation against me, and I was certain it wouldn't be the last. Actors talk so much, not enough people focus on the things they won't say. So I did. I built my career in silences and averted glances, paying attention to who missed work, who skipped parties. I asked why, and when no one answered, I filled in the blanks myself. The day I talked with Charles, I considered asking him to give me whatever he believed to be the correct story, to tell me what I had missed. By that time, he was blacklisted from every studio in Hollywood. He had nothing to lose. But he didn't want to talk. He paced around my living room and made reference to a party we'd all been at before the war. He had every reason to remember it well. It was his engagement party. That was all he had to say. Charles Landry was done talking for a while. I told him to gain 10 pounds and join the army. He did. Let's talk about the night in question, the night I allegedly ruined a life or two or three. Thomas Broadbeck's party celebrating the engagement of FWM studio stars, Charles Landry and Nell Parker, August 1939. The guest list included a group of people whose lives would be altered by that night. Charles and Nell, Augustine Charters and myself, Margie Prescott and her notably absent husband, Hal Bingham, and Sophie Melrose, a young actress who only wanted to go to her first Hollywood party. Finally, there is the man who had not been invited but arrived anyway, Freddie Clark. When I told my brother Seb we'd be stopping at a party that night, I might have intentionally withheld some details. It was his first day in Los Angeles, so the name Thomas Broadbeck meant little to him. There wasn't any reason why Sebastian O'Shaughnessy, darling of the New York literati, should have any idea who the FWM studio chief was, or even what a studio chief did. As soon as I began listing the names of actors and actresses, though, Seb understood. We won't have to stay long, he asked. An hour at the most, not even that, I said. I told him we had to say hello to Broadbeck and congratulate Charles and Nell on their <laughs> pretend engagement. Public appearances like these were part of my contract with the studio. I had convinced Seb to move to Hollywood on the pretense that I was a moderately successful actress who could land him a job screenwriting. The thing is, I really was a moderately successful actress who could land him a job screenwriting. My only omission to my brother was that I only had three months left in my contract. And FWM Studios doesn't renew contracts for moderately successful actresses. Anyway, you have to talk to Augustine, I said, as I poured us each a glass of whiskey, mine on the rocks, his straight. I don't know who that is. You'll love him, I lied. He runs all the things at FWM that no one else has time to run. 
I already told him you'd be there. He's excited to meet you. I'm certain he can get you a job. As I began going up the stairs to change into my dress, Seb demanded that I wait a goddamn minute. Seb still had a heavy accent from our years growing up in Boston. His voice went up as he spoke to me, and for a moment I saw the young boy he had been, the lanky awkwardness of his posture and the redness in his pale cheeks. Though we regularly rode each other, I hadn't seen him in person for a long time. Between the two of us, I was the one who could afford to travel, and I hadn't left California since the early 30s. I talked about it in my letters to him, swearing I'd take the time off to visit, but the time off never came. You told me I already had a job, he said. I shook my head and pursed my lips. I wouldn't have said that. Seb went over to his worn down briefcase by the front door and began rummaging through it. He produced a handwritten letter. He went over to the couch and smoothed the letter out on the coffee table. I watched as he bent over it, carefully running his finger along each line. There, he said, pointing to the letter. In your own words, one week ago, if you come to Hollywood, you'll have a job. I nodded and leaned against the banister. Yes, you will have a job. Look at you, college graduate, one novel published already. You're very employable. That's why we're going to the party. I took out my savings to come here, Edie, he said. I got rid of everything I had. I replied, and I'm sure the mattress on your floor is happy to be in a new in a dumpster somewhere. <laughs> I looked at Seb in my living room, his red hair standing on end and his shirt wrinkled. He'd arrived from the train station only a few hours earlier. I don't suppose you have a suit, I asked. Seb was not amused when I came down the stairs 15 minutes later in a gown. The gown was on loan from a friend in the FWM costuming department. It was intended to be worn by Carla Longworth in an upcoming romantic drama, but she'd rejected the fabric choice, said the tool made her look too wide. I wasn't sure how wide the tool made me look and frankly didn't care. It wasn't as though I was in the running to be the most beautiful woman at that party. Anyone from the studio would be able to identify the dress for what it was, but I could see Seb doing mental calculations of its worth. That's how it had always been with me and Seb. After a childhood of scarcity, we can never stop praising what was in front of us. Even if I had told Seb the gown wasn't mine, he still would have resented me for making him go to a party underdressed. He spent the entire car ride over, picking out his <laughs> sleeves and smoothing out his trousers. Trust me, I said, they'll think it's very New York of you. That kind of credibility gets people jobs here. Humiliating is what it is. I replied, well, I'd hate for you to discover the kind of get ups that actresses have to wear to be employed here. All right, Lindsay, one PNP alum to another. How's it feel to be back? <laughs> it's very surreal, um, especially this is the second bookstore that I've worked at and done an event at. Um, yeah, it's bizarre to have people like shuffling my books for me. I'm like, no, 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 I, I do that. I can do that. I know how to. I can hop on the reg right now. <laughs> that makes one of us. Yeah. <laughs> so when you worked here, was Edie living in your head already or was she living on the page already? She was in the page, um, but definitely it was a strange thing because I did a lot of rewriting of this book during the pandemic and Edie like became my like trauma bound friend during the pandemic. So I constantly just had her voice in my head all the time, just this transatlantic, like fun old broad, just <laughs> hanging out with me. We all lost it a little bit during the pandemic. I'm glad I had Edie for company. She's very good company and she's seductive company. People tell her many things that they should not tell her. Huh. Are you that kind of person also? <laughs> It's funny. I never thought of myself as a gossipy person. Like Edie is, she's a former actress. She becomes a gossip columnist because she always knows the dirt. Edie is a very active gossipy person. She will go into a room. She will work the room. She will learn everyone's business all the time. I think I've found myself to be a passively gossipy person. Um, if there's drama on Twitter, yes, I will read every quote, tweet and thread until I get to the bottom of it. And I learned that I'm the same way with the archives. If there's drama between actors and actresses in Golden Age Hollywood, I'm going to go down a research rabbit hole and figure out what the drama is till I get to the bottom of it. So tell me the order of operations with you in Golden Age Hollywood. Were you obsessed and then started writing a book? Did you decide to write a book and then realize it should be set in Golden Age Hollywood? And then once you were there, how'd you do the research? So I've 
definitely always been a big fan of old films. I grew up watching them with my parents. Like my sick day movie was bringing up baby. Um, but how this book came to be was I went off to an MFA program at University of Wyoming. I went to this program with a very cute and charming idea that I was a contemporary short story writer. I am not a contemporary short story writer. <laughs> um, a few months into the program, I had two other projects that I was supposed to be doing. And I went to the library and just for funsies, picked up a book called City of Nets by Otto Friedrich, which is a year by year gossipy history of golden age Hollywood. It's super fun. It's well researched, but like a lot of anecdotes, a lot of gossip. And for months, this book was the only thing I could read. I had so many other things I was supposed to be reading, so many other projects I was supposed to be doing. All I wanted to do was learn the drama and the dirt of golden age Hollywood. Then I was coming up with characters. Then I was rewatching the films. Then I was joking to people. I'm like, I'm totally writing 1940s fan fiction. <laughs> um, I wasn't writing 1940s fan fiction. Uh, I quickly realized I was fully writing a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and when in that process did Edie present herself? So Edie was a funny character. Originally, when I first tried this novel, so the first chapter of the novel takes place at a party, which we saw a very early glimpse of and description of. Um, the sequence of events at that first chapter was always the same. We go to the party. There's an incident at the party. Um, I initially tried it out with a shifting third person perspective. It didn't work. Um, there are a bunch of different people. They all saw the same thing. They all agreed about what happened. There was no tension to build a book off of. It just didn't work. And I realized the only way this book would work would be to put it into first person. At this point, Edie wasn't even one of the perspectives. She's just a random person at this party who's bothering everybody and they keep warning each other. But I realized I needed a first person narrator. I needed somebody who had a very clear voice, who could see everything and think she knows everything, but also had a lot of room to misinterpret events. And once I figured, like I didn't even try another first person narrator, I knew it had to be Edie. And once I started with her voice, I couldn't stop. <laughs> it's reading her is similar. <laughs> She's a fun broad. <laughs> so at this party, you just des you describe the guests as highly curated, exemplary creatures. They're highly groomed. They're highly managed. These are stars. What is it like to write a world where everyone is so perfect? Yeah, it was really interesting diving into the research under the studio system, which the 1940s studio system of Hollywood, like they created these stars. Once you signed a contract with a studio, you were there for seven years. They could change your name. They could change how you look. They would change your backstory. They tell you who you're dating, what your interests <laughs> and hobbies are. Um, so going into that, I was a little bit worried because this is a very heavily mythologized era of history. Like we have a very clear idea of, you know, how these actors and actresses look, how they act. Um, and I was a little terrified to be playing with something that is so often written about. We have such a clear idea of what it's supposed to look like. But then I realized I just have a bunch of fun tropes of beautiful people. You have the gorgeous starlet who's trying to break through. You have the cowboy. Um, and playing against those tropes actually turned into my favorite part of this book, was really digging into that space between the polished exterior that the studio has created and what their interior lives actually are. And then I'm not going to give away the incident or yeah, go any. It. No, no, I won't. I promise. I promise. But I will say that there is one bad guy in this book and he he's bad. It's very clear. You make it very clear that this is not Edie misinterpreting. There's no in the contemporary reader's mind. There's no way to think that this guy is not bad. He, he's the exception to the rule of the space between the perfect and the real. We see the real. Mm hmm. Was that a choice or did it just happen? And what were the challenges of having a bad, bad guy? Yeah, so I I can just say it. it's Freddie Clark. He's based on the actor Errol Flynn. Um, so this book kind of fell into place in terms of the narrative when I started digging into Errol Flynn, who's best known for playing Robin Hood. He was an on-screen darling, like every fan magazine. He was the number one pick for months at a time. In his private life, he was an absolute monster. He, multiple arrests, he'd go to parties and get kicked out for things like punching somebody's butler. Um, but this all culminated in 1943. Errol Flynn went to trial for assaulting two underage girls. And when I introduced the character of Freddie Clark, like, it was important to me to have somebody who, like, we don't need to know about this man's interiority. We don't need to spend time on it. Like, 
he is a bad person. What was more interesting to me was spending time with how do people respond to this person? How, who tries to support him? Who tries to stand up to him? What does it reveal about the people in this world, in this network, as they respond to and reflect this man? Well, one of the major tensions of the book is that a lot of people want to stand up to him but can't because of their contracts. A lot of people would like to stand up to him, but contract, social pressure, combination thereof, cannot. And so it's clear for much of the book that what he deserves will not come to him. Huh. I would not call this a Me Too novel. It is set in the 40s. However, what was it like for you to write in a post-Me Too world a novel where a bad man is not going to be held accountable? Yeah, it was it was a strange experience to be researching this because a lot of the research happened around 2018, 2019, which is when the Me Too movement really was picking up steam. Um, and I, going into this, I really didn't want to try to like bend this novel to my contemporary viewpoints, both in terms of trying to impose my own morals on this era, but also in terms of being truthful to the era because like Edie is not a she's not necessarily a good person she makes some really really harmful choices to me and throughout this process of writing this book and revising this book finding an agent finding an editor it was really important to me to be protective over that part of Edie my worst fear for this book was I would end up in a position where somebody wants Edie to be like a plucky feminist <laughs> like go get the men type of woman yeah. because it's just not truthful to history like she couldn't be that person during this time frame. She can recognize that she's complicit with this, but the restraints under her, both because of the world she lives in, because of the period she grew up in, it's just not realistic for her to be that person as much as we would love for her to be that person. Well, it's another one of the book's central tensions, I think, is understanding that she can't be who we wish and maybe who she herself wishes that she is. So you referred to her earlier as a fun old broad. And the book is technically set in the 80s, right? It is narrating from the future, mm -hmm. remembering things that happened, things she did, how she became the most feared woman in Hollywood. Why pick that that future telling point, long retrospective in MFA language? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we love MFA language. It's more vocab where that came from. <laughs> yeah, so... I think there's an initial version where the book was meant to be like a found object. It was supposed to be a memoir published in the 1950s anonymously because um, I really wanted to have that scope of like, I didn't want it to just be stuck in the time period. I wanted to have there be a sense of like, we are looking back on this. The found object version didn't really work um, for a couple of reasons, but I realized I could pull off a very similar move if I had Edie narrating this as a much older person. But one of the interesting things about this book and writing this book to me was I wanted to have a narrator who is changed by the world. Like, I think in America, especially, we get really obsessed with narratives of like individualism, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And I wanted a narrative of somebody who time changes her. She doesn't necessarily have that like I'm going to change the world all by myself attitude. But she lives through decades because if she's narrating from the 80s, she would have lived through the civil rights movement. She would have lived through the feminist movement. I was interested in having a narrator who has to look back on her past choices from the perspective of living through history. This is maybe an end of the conversation question that I'm going to ask in the middle. Do you think you're going to be tempted to go back to Edie or write about Edie in some of the other decades that she you know, between the book's action and the book's telling? I feel like I'm I'm prepared to relinquish Edie to the world. <laughs> I was also very, very sternly warned that if you write two Hollywood novels, people will get mad at you if you write anything that's not a Hollywood novel. <laughs> Fair. So I'm, I would love to hang out with Edie, but I think Edie is worse now. <laughs> very, that seems very, very emotionally healthy of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about Edie's ideas about gossip and also your ideas about gossip. Um, so there's a during a trial in the book, um, Edie says, most trials are gossip only with state mandated consequences. I read that. I just imagined my lawyer brother's hairs standing straight up on his head. 
<laughs> but it's not. How true is that? It's not not true. It's not not true. It's also of the era, I think. Although I'm not going to try to get into any lawyer's business right now. <laughs> He's far away. He's not okay, gonna okay. <laughs> Don't send him the YouTube link, okay? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was really interested in the machine of gossip at the time, and especially gossip under the studio system, because the studios at this time had such uncontested power. Um, you know, somebody like Edie has to play very, very carefully with what she's allowed to publish, what she's allowed to write. And the thing that made me fixate on the Errol Flynn trial was just that it went to trial. Like, I was so shocked that a case like this would go to trial, nonetheless, a case with a very, very famous actor. Um, and in this book, I wanted to think about, you know, what would it take for a case like this to go to trial? Because I do alter a lot of the circumstances of the actual Errol Flynn trial. Um, and where would those lines be drawn in terms of, you know, what would it take for this to go to trial? How would people respond to it? And how Edie would be allowed to write about it, especially because she can't cross the studios. Um, you know, she can get blacklisted if she publishes something out of line. She has to be really, really careful about how she's going to toe this line, how she's going to write about it. There's a lot of questioning in the book about the ethics of writing gossip. Uh, no, no one agrees. I mean, I think that if it, the book would flatten out if everyone agreed. But how how did you deal for yourself as a writer with having a book with such a giant, shifting, unanswerable ethical question at its center? <laughs> Easy question. Let's get into ethics. <laughs> not, not your ethics, just the ethical question. <laughs> yeah. I A lot of what I thought about with this was the machine of gossip today versus during the time period, because I grew up like late 90s, early 2000s, which was... The terrain of gossip back then was very, very different. You had like Perez Hilton. Um, it was very violent, especially how people wrote about women, how they wrote about queer people. And I was interested in how gossip functioned <laughs> under the studio system. What somebody like Edie would be allowed to write about, how she would have to use, you know, between the lines and innuendo to kind of achieve the same things. But Gossip albums of the time, they really, really were pretty restrained. Um, yeah, and it was tricky for me to think about, you know, like going into this, I thought like, oh, Edie's going to like, she's going to go for all of these actors and actresses. She's going to like write about people, you know, having children out of wedlock. Um, and as I researched, I realized like they really couldn't do that as much because again, getting blacklisted from the studios, your career's pretty much over. Did it make your life easier or harder to write inside the constraints of what Edie herself would have been constrained by? Yeah, for sure. I think it was an easy shift into Edie's mind, but I definitely, like I was saying before, like trying not to impose my own viewpoints on Edie and allowing for the fact that at the end of the day, Edie is a white woman. She was born in 1914, probably. Um, and having to understand that Edie... Like, I'm not going to agree with her. And it's not fair to history for me to try to change her, to mold her to the contemporary, my contemporary viewpoints. How about in terms of plot, though? Like, <laughs> you can't do as a writer what Edie can't do as a writer. Did, th did that ever give you, did you have stumbling blocks that Edie herself would also have had in a logistical sense? Yeah, I think so. I think. It was tricky for me to figure out how to write about real life people and what to do with the fact that there are name drops of famous actors and actresses. Um, but shifting into Edie's mind, you know, as a person who's not as gossipy as her, I definitely, I don't know, I think part of what helped me with managing that was giving Edie a brother who is a writer mm -hmm. um, because he was able to serve as like my kind of foil. Um, you know, Edie has to like have conversations with him about how she's writing about real people with real consequences. Um, and she looks at her brother, she's like, you don't have to deal with that. I'm like, oh, Edie, you have no idea. <laughs> I know. So Edie's brother is a novelist specifically. Um, and novelists are frequently accused of lifting from life. Um, but I imagine there must have been, pandemic aside, even MFA aside, a huge escapist element to writing this book, even in the tough, the tough scenes. Huh. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think part of it was, you know, doing a lot of drafting for this book. I was, like I said, I went to University of Wyoming for my MFA. 
an important thing to know about Wyoming is that it's winter for like nine months there. <laughs> it's not just winter. It is like below 10 wind chill winter. You really have a choice of cabin fever or write a novel. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I picked write a novel, but I can't say that I didn't really pick Cabin Fever as well. Um, I, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> um, escapism. D oh, yeah. Discuss. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, I watched a bajillion 1940s Hollywood films. So basically, I, for a period of time, restrained everything that I was watching, what I was listening to. I was only watching movies made between 1935 and 1945. Listening to, I, it was a little trickier for me to stay within the era because um, big bands are nice, but they're very tricky to write to. <laughs> Cheated on the music, um, but I also kept with like only reading things from the era. And it was a nice escape from that winter, but it also was definitely a little bit of cabin fever going on. <laughs> Were there contemporary or more contemporary contemporary books that you looked at, but like books you admire, books that you would like this to sit on a shelf with? Yeah, I I had my stack of emotional support books, which I'm a little bit embarrassed because these are they're all like man booker winners. <laughs> like you'll have to I, say their titles. <laughs> I mean, I was sitting with like Atonement was one that honestly I mostly reread the first half of Atonement because I think it's a perfect domestic no novella um, with a bunch of war stuff tacked on at the end, and I'm like maybe I just have the perfect domestic novella. Um, I read a lot of books that had a narrator who has to reckon with a choice that they made in their past and has to realize that they did something harmful and the way that it's affected other people. So I looked at Atonement. I looked at Margaret Atwood's The Blind Assassin was another book that was so huge and important. That's my favorite book of all time. Um, but yeah, I, I really wanted to look at narratives where you have a narrator realizing over the course of the novel that they are complicit with the system, even if they have been lying to themselves for years about this choice that they've made and having to reckon with that. And I should be clear, I mean, you read, so this is clear, but these are very weighty questions, but tonally, the book is very fun. And not only because Edie is fun, you know, because you have made, I think, this commitment to writing a book that is both serious and fun. Um, and I imagine that that's, I mean, I know it's a hard balance to strike at any point. I imagine it's really hard when you have cabin fever and it's negative a million. Um, so I how- was a fun person during that time. <laughs> no, like how did you make sure you were injecting the amount of fun that you wanted into the book? Yeah, it's tricky because it is a fun, like I love this era. I'm very honest about how I write about it and the pro like the problems with it because- if you watch those movies, my God, so much racism, misogyny, you name it, it's all there. And I don't want to ignore that. But at the same time, like, I love to write about parties. I like to write about dresses. It is a very, like, we love that era for a reason. It is very beautiful. Um, but it was important to me to balance out that beauty with what is lying underneath it. And I mean, Edie is a fun broad to hang out with, and it was fun to craft her voice, but I also was always trying to be very careful of, you know, she is such a voicey, charismatic character, trying to break through that and focus in on those moments where Edie is going to betray herself was definitely a long process and figuring out, like, where are the cracks in Edie? Like, how do I get her to kind of start to break down a little bit? <laughs> Well, I do actually want to talk about dresses because um, there's a lot of very good fashion description in the book and not so many contemporary writers write about fashion. You don't get a lot of description of what people are wearing and what people are wearing is, is quite important. Um, you learn a lot from a person, from a person's outfit about that person. Um, and I'd love to know how you, how you research the fashion in the book, how you thought about using the fashion in the book. Um, how you leaned into the glamour I of your setting. Question. Um, I spent a lot of time with fan magazines of the era, which was one of my favorite parts of researching was just flipping through fan magazines, which you have these decadent fashion spreads. You also have the funniest ads I've ever read, um, which I, I can't bring one to mind right now, but I would just read them out loud to myself in a transatlantic accent. Again, cabin fever cannot emphasize this <laughs> enough. Um, but fashion was really important to me in writing this because Again, these stars were so carefully curated. 
there weren't many opportunities for them to truly express themselves. So, you know, writing the clothing of a character like Nell, who is this like up and coming, she's like a cutthroat actress. She wants to be Norma Shearer. Um, writing how she dresses herself and where those moments are where she can, even though she can't give statements, can't say what she wants to say because the studio has such a hold on her. How can she use clothing to talk? And then as a foil to her, there's another character in the book, Inez Marquis, who is this Parisian heiress. She, an uncle died, just gave her a ridiculous amount of money. She's now the primary stockholder in FWM Studios. Um, she doesn't care about the rules and writing how Inez dresses herself versus how Nell would dress herself was a really fun experience and just kind of digging into that history of when women weren't given the words or even men at times how clothing was kind of a sneaky way for them to do that. Well, speaking of fan magazines, I meant to ask you this earlier, but can you talk a little bit about the role that celebrity gossip and that these celebrities played for the average American in the moment? Because that really pops up a lot in the book. Yeah. Um, Pre-social media, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> but what was so interesting to me was how carefully crafted their personas were in these fan magazines like I'm not joking when I say they would make up hobbies for actors and actresses and they would stage entire photo shoots of them like fake fishing and be like they love to fish <laughs> thank you um so I had a really fun time just kind of digging into how the studio like going through these magazines, seeing where the studio's hands were, where you could kind of pinpoint like, okay, a publicist is behind this, somebody is orchestrating this, and then trying to dig into the cracks and seeing like those small moments where there is a true person there um, and where that kind of carefully curated persona starts to fall apart. Do you think you consume contemporary celebrity media, social media and gossip differently as a result? Like, can you turn off the investigating gaze? I don't know that I can. I loved, again, passive gossip. I love to get to the bottom of the dirt. But I think researching this, like, like I was saying with, you know, tabloid culture when I was growing up, it really did change how I looked at that. And, you know, for me, my interest in gossip has been, I think of it as kind of like a measuring stick for what a society's morals are. You know, who do we, when we look at our celebrities, you know, in other... In England, they might be looking at monarchies. We don't have kings and queens. We've got celebrities. We're looking at, you know, what kind of behavior do we praise? What do we cast out and why? And it really tells a lot about a society of any given era or decade, you know, what behavior was okay. And even in my own lifetime, seeing how, like, I mean, free Britney. We love her now. <laughs> I'm pro Paris Hilton. Like, it's really caused a reevaluation of how we talked about these women when I was a kid versus how we're reevaluating those moments now. I've been trying to not bring up Brittany the whole time. So I got you. I did. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was crazy also for me to read this book in the middle of the Hollywood writers strike. Um, and Seb, the writer brother, does become a Hollywood writer and is not treated in a way that a writer would like to be treated. And it's it's upsetting to see how much power the studios still have over writers, even in contrast to the absolutely crazy power that they had um, in the 40s. Yeah, the research on Seb was fun because I got to dig into all those very, very famous writers who ended up in Hollywood. Um, you know, I think of like William Faulkner, who famously at one point, he was supposed to be working on a script and he asked, you know, whoever his boss was, he's like, can I go home? And they thought he meant to like his hotel and he straight up packed up and went back to Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> he meant home. <laughs> um, and also like F. Scott Fitzgerald, there's countless of them who are just kind of like trapped in these weird studio contracts. They had to write these like just crappy scripts. And um, it gets even weirder once you get to World War II because you start getting European Cast offs, yeah. like very, very famous European figures who the studio executives in Hollywood are like, we don't know who this guy is. Put him on a like children's movie. Sure, why not? <laughs> All right. I do know that it's time to let you guys ask questions soon, but I do have to ask. In the dream world, Greta Gerwig walks in the door. She says, I'm not going to make eight Mattel movies. I actually want to adapt. Do tell. Would you write the script knowing what you know about Hollywood? <laughs> I and have and to stop sobbing first. <laughs> you're done. You're done sobbing. Now you have the choice of writing the script, and you get to pick one star. 
Oh man, one star. I'm gonna go with like a smaller character. There is a character. This is my favorite side character to write, Bear Dewitt. Oh, I love Bear. Yeah, he's a he appears in a couple scenes. He's like Edie's. Let's go out and party and drink, pal. Like he is a character actor. He's a Vincent Price type character actor. Um, so he's just gonna show up in like a pinstripe shoot suit and just tear it up. Every time I wrote Bear Dewitt, I imagine Richard E. Grant. Um, that's the first one that comes to mind. It's I change my mind on who I'd cast as Edie literally every day. I think most recently it was Jillian Jacobs. <laughs> okay, but do you write the script? Oh, right. Do I? <laughs> I'm already casting it. Of course I'm writing the script. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, now, now last question. So I just want to say prepare both emotionally and by going to the mic right there. Um, if you would like to ask Lindsay a question, like Keith, like Keith said, I was the event coordinator here for several years. So if you start doing, um, this is more of a comment. I, I have no, I will bust you. I have no shame uh, or restraint. Yeah. So you're a book buyer now um, at a really, really great independent bookstore. Um, you want to tell these people what to read next? Tom Lake by Ann Patchett. I'll go this first. It is very good. Yeah. Um, what have I, I recently read Banyan Moon by Tao Tai, which is a wonderful intergenerational story of American Vietnamese women. Um, I also have just like a lot of debut author summer 2023 solidarity. So I'm like Banyan Moon, Lucky Red by Claudia Cravens. If you want a queer Western, um, is fabulous. I could keep going, but... All Night Pharmacy by Ruth Medvisky, Ooh, which yeah. is um, if you want like a David Lynchian fever dream. All right. I see our first questioner. So let's hand it over. Thank you, Lindsay. So it's more of a comment. It isn't. <laughs> so your blurbs are spectacular. What's the one that knocked your socks off? Who were you? I'm, I'm sure you're equally excited for each person who blurbed the book. But what one really surprised you? Geraldine Brooks. Um <laughs> Just to like be a hundred percent transparent, so Geraldine Brooks came to the store Parnassus um, like a year or so ago, and she had to sign about a thousand books. I was just the person who sat there and moved the books for her. We didn't talk that much, um, and then when the book went to her and she sent in a blurb, I was just like, "I am so glad I shuffled books for you, Geraldine." <laughs> Here's a gossip question while we wait for the next audience question. What's the weirdest book shuffling experience you've ever had? Because I know we've both had a lot. <laughs> Mine was with an astronaut. Um, I had one author talk about AI for a while. This is George Saunders. He went off about oh. AI and all kinds of bizarre things. He was just a delight. He sang Lincoln in the Bardo, so oh. like he was extra. He was in his he was in his zone. It was great. That's great. Hi there. In your research on the Errol Flynn trial, it must have been fascinating to to dig up all this stuff and to, and to see what was going on. Anything, what like sort of really jumped out at you about what was going on back then and really threw you? Yeah, it was definitely the parallels between how people talked about the girls. So Errol Flynn, it was two underage girls, Peggy, Peggy Satterley and Be Betty Hansen. Um, and the way that the press talked about those two girls, they dug into their past. They found anything. One of the girls they believed had an abortion. She'd had affairs before. Um, and they kept trying to use this to mitigate the fact that they were both underage. Like that should have been the end of the conversation. Um, and the way that it paralleled today was just very unnerving in how they talked about it. A strange thing about this book was, again, just finding all the moments in the past that just we're eerily close to today. Um, there's one chapter in the book, which I won't spoil it for anybody. You'll know it when you get there, though. It's not graphic, but it's just it's a very upsetting chapter um, that happens after the trial. And that entire thing is taken like the concept of that chapter is taken almost directly from a memoir by Errol Flynn stunt double. Uh, which I am very angry I had to read. <laughs> but it was just a bizarre experience of the parts of the book that just kept reflecting were the parts that I wasn't making up. Hey, me again. Um, excuse me. Um, working uh, 
in bookstores um, in, in this one and Parnassus, and now being on the other side with uh, publishing the book, what has surprised you most about the process of uh, bringing a book uh, to fruition? And this could be for you too, Lily, as well, being in the process. <laughs> yeah, I thought about this a lot when I was when the book went on submission to different editors, because I think, you know, your average debut novelist is just excited about like being published at all. Like there are a lot of exciting parts of the process. You want a book cover, you want to like have a publisher. I am over here as a book buyer thinking about shipping times and warehouse efficiency. That's where my brain is at when I went on submission because I know which I stay up late at night thinking about which publishers have the best warehouses because if your book goes out of stock, you want that book back in stock. So I think that I definitely had an altered experience throughout this because I do think about you know, weird parts of this process. I also think a lot about our, like the sales reps that each publisher has. I remember I cheered when I had a bid from Doubleday because I was like, that's my favorite sales rep. <laughs> Don't tell the other ones. <laughs> Hi, congratulations. And I love your shoes. Those in the back, you should check out the shoes. Um, I'm just curious, you, you mentioned uh, going deep into the archives. And so besides fan magazines, what archives did you dig into? Yeah, um, for Errol Flynn, that was probably the biggest deep dive I did. Um, thank God for University of Wyoming's library system. I miss my JSTOR account and my access to like the entire archives of like the LA Times and New York Times. Um, so a lot of it was just going in with different actor names and trying to figure out, like, how did people talk about these two? I also read a lot of memoirs and autobiographies of actors and actresses of the time. At one point, I had both. So Edie has two historic counterparts, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons. Um, at the initial stages of researching this book, I tried to kind of withhold some information for myself about those two because... I wanted Edie to exist as her own kind of organic person. So at one point I had both their memoirs and I would just read random pages at a time to kind of get the cadences, how they wrote about people, what they were thinking about, but without making Edie a carbon copy of either. So I definitely divided my research into, there were a lot of like fixed things that I had to know backwards and forwards. I had to know about the studio system, how it operated, how it affected the press. But then there were also a lot of textural details, you know, trying to get the cadences of a gossip columnist from the time. And also reading all of those gossip columns was so fun. Um, but also I would watch movies both actively and passively. So at different points, I would be paying close attention to movies. Sometimes I would just have them on in the background so that I could pick up on speech patterns or kind of get a glimpse at clothing and not necessarily have it be tied into like the plot of the film, but just sort of getting a feel for them in that sense. This is this is a follow up to what you're just talking about. Hedda Hopper, was she one of the people that was an influence on Edie? I'm, I was born in the 50s and I remember Hedda Hopper. <laughs> yeah, like I said early on, I tried to you know give Edie some distance from Hedda uh, and Luella, but she definitely has more notes of Hedda because uh, Hedda also started off as an actress. Right, and then Errol Flynn. I always heard that he was bisexual. Did you find that to be true? <laughs> I. I tried to toe a very specific line in terms of how I researched and looked at actors' sexuality because, again, I grew up in an era when... In an era. I'm a historical figure. <laughs> um, but there was a period of time when, you know, outing people without their consent was, like, a fairly violent act at times. So for me, it's a hard question to answer answer for myself because on the one hand like I don't want this part of somebody's identity to be removed it's you know there's also a lot of speculation about like Cary Grant he lived with another actor named Randolph Scott for 12 years they were roommates okay um you know it's hard for me to want to preserve that part of somebody's identity because so much of queer history gets erased it gets taken from us because it wasn't allowed to exist openly in the first place while also respecting that Cary Grant's estate really, really does not want you to talk about that. Um, so I, I reckon with this myself by more so looking at how queer communities during the time were able to form, um, how people were able to live these very, very private lives 
under the studio system, which probably was going to like, you know, if you're a gay man, they're just going to assign you a wife. And that was going to be your wife for a couple of years until you get a divorce um, and finding those like coded languages in those moments and figuring out, you know, how do these communities form and exist in private against this very, very public face. Hello, Lindsay. Hello. God, I remember your third birthday party. <laughs> was it at a bookstore? It was wonderful. We had a bunny rabbit. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, what are you thinking about writing about next? What era is intriguing you or interesting you? Yeah. If y'all think I get excited about film history, wait till you see how I feel about art history. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm currently dabbling around in the 1950s and 60s New York art scene, um, looking at some of the married partners who the man is very, very famous. The woman is also a painter. Um, yes. And looking at those dynamics and that relationship is kind of, I like writing about public figures. I like writing about what gets archived, what we remember about these figures and what the kind of hidden story is. So that's where I'm, I'm poking around right now. Helen Frankenthaler and Lee Krasner. Mm-hmm. They're going to it. I'm researching something about them right now, too. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. You want to sign some books? I would love to sign some books. Thank you so much. The Line